No, welcome everybody to uh, Drawing Movements. I'm so excited to have this conversation with some amazing animators uh, for the Roxbury International Film Festival. Um, so uh, we've got some incredible panelists today and I'm going to uh, let them go ahead, introduce themselves. And I will start with uh, Mr. Tyrone Motley, AKA Zero Snake. Hi everybody, nice to meet you. As my friend Kagan just said, my name is Tyrone Motley also known as the animator and artist Zero Snake. Um, you guys see some of my work behind me and I'm also the creator of Unrivaled the Manga. So you guys check that out on zerosnake.com. I'm happy to be here. I've been animating for uh, over a decade. Uh, started off indie and uh, just branching out more and more, you know? So. All right, uh, Mark. Hello, everybody. Uh, Mark Davis, uh, one half of the Mad Twins. Uh, been animating, been doing cartoons and animation for a good amount of years, good 20 years. Um, currently in uh, Los Angeles, working at um, Sony as supervising director on uh, Young Love. Awesome. Mike? Peace, y'all. Uh, excited to be here. My name's Mike Davis, the other half of the Mad Twins. Uh, a lot like my brother said, been in animation for 20 years, um, independent, moved into the industry system, worked on shows like Boondocks and Black Dynamite, and uh, yeah, have some exciting stuff coming up, so happy to be here. Awesome. And Uzo. Hello, everybody. My name is Uzo. Um, I'm pretty new to the field and world of animation. I'm actually still a student. I'm an art film major at Harvard, but I have really big goals to continue to pursue animation after I graduate. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be able to chat with everyone on this panel and to um, speak with all of you. All right, thank you so much. And they're all amazing animators. And most importantly, Uzo has a film in the Roxbury Film Festival, which is showing on Saturday, I believe, as part of the a shorts program. Uh, I've forgotten what the name is, apologize. But definitely check that out. Um, so let's just hop right into it. Um, so first of all, acknowledging that uh, making films is a ton of work. There's, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to get together um, any kind of film is a lot of work, but animation is certainly not the simplest form. It's a, you know, it's a very labor intensive and uh, challenging art form to uh, use. So I just wonder from all of you, um, what made you choose animation as the way to tell your stories? And I'll start with Uzo. Yeah, I think for me, I started out with illustration. My background is actually illustrated by me. And I feel like it just made sense when it came to wanting to progress into storytelling to kind of take my illustrations and figure out ways to, you know, make them move and to figure out ways to capture movement and animation. And I just love that animation allows you to push the bounds of reality. I think live action filmmaking is incredible, but there obviously are some limitations. You can't you know, aliens aren't real, they aren't on Earth. You can't, you know, make a movie about actual aliens. You can't make movies about, there's some things that, you know, live action, even though with all of its progressions, there's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of different effects and special effects that can be made. But animation, I feel like is so beautiful because the possibilities are truly endless, what you can explore, what you can create. And I think that's my favorite thing about the medium is that there are no bounds. Either you can tell all types of stories, create all types of worlds, all types of characters. And there's always this unique artistic flair that comes with every animation, every animator, every animated film. So yeah, that's why I love the medium. Awesome. Um, Mike, why did you choose to become, to get into animation? Um, well, I always had a love for, for visual art. You know, we started young with graffiti and, and just the idea of capturing characters in your own style. And that was the impetus between like taking real life and transforming it into my perspective, you know what I mean? And then being able, able to express it to the rest of the world in a fly way. Um, and it does allow you to be extremely creative and, and there's no um, budget constraints when you're just creating freely, right? Um, 
when you get into professional anim animation, of course, there's budget constraints. But when you're when you're drawing, you can create, you can world build, and you don't have to worry about, you know, the the logistics of of physical space, right? You're, you're working straight from your mind onto the paper or a digital platform or whatever vehicle you use. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons why um, I chose animation. I, I know there's another one I, I'm going to leave it for Mark to speak on because <laughs> it's pretty much the one that um, got us to where we are. Nice. Well, then I'll, I'll let Mark follow up then. All right. Well, you set me up because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking uh, you about. Know, you, know, you know what it is. <laughs> when we, when we um, first got into the game. Oh, um, well, what what really like intrigues me about animation and um and just like the art form itself is is the fact that you can you like like the everything is created like from your mind right so like every idea every thought has your interpretation and and you you make you're making something that's non tangible physical and then you're creating creating a world um and we started off with comic books, and I think this is what Mike's alluding to. But we started we started off with, with comic books and captured um, a lot of like a lot of our influences and characters um, just throughout the years. And when we put it down all on paper, it kind of um, like when we gave a, like our, our particular voice to it, um, it was just something something very different at the time that people didn't really see, and it just really really catapulted us into. Um, you know, into, you know, our careers today. Um, it's, it's called Blockheads and a lot of people familiar with it um, who've been following us. Um, but that was just a really like clear and like, like, like a, I don't know, it was a, it was a really good reason why like for us to, um, to, to, to do animation. That one, it started out as a comic book. It started out as a comic book, yeah. And it just, it just felt like it needed to move then. Yeah, it just felt like it was just like 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 Uzo was saying. It's like when you start with illustrations, and we've been telling stories since we were kids. Um, like uh, grounded, like just drunk, like creating stories. Like and so the natural progression was to see those. Like we already had the stories, but then we just needed to see them move, and then it was just it just all kind of just grew organically. Dope. What about you? I don't know if that's. I don't, I don't, I'm yeah, sorry. That, is that, yeah, yeah. No, that is, that is exactly what I was saying. I know. I knew you saying get to it all right nice uh, and what about you zero snake so uh i'm just I'm, i agree with a lot of what's said here it's actually uh kind of funny how similar a lot of our <laughs> a lot of our starting is you know um like the uh panelists on here i started off just traditional il illustration um and you know moved on to trying to establish my own characters my own world building and you know i I feel like we all start off with like doing some fan art of some degree up until like, you know, a sign clicks in our brain and says, hey, you know, I got some characters in here too that need to come out, you know, so. Um, so why did I choose animation? Um, I suppose there's kind of like a natural progression. Like when I, when I see a finalized comic book page or, you know, when I'm working on it, is the hype, you know, when you see something coming out how you want it to come is just extreme hype to it. And when you translate that to animation, then like the hype just reaches another level. Like I can't be the only person like um, just playing back a test animation. And when you see like it, it move right in the, like, you know, the characters reacted in an actual way, like the impact of a punch or whatever just hits right. It's just like jumping out of your seat kind of excitement. So, you know, um, just wanted to, create dope, dope material, man. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think what you're saying is true that a lot of it is similar because when it comes down to it, we're all storytellers, right? We just, right. we all have our stories to tell and we just use different mediums to do so. Um, so when I was putting this panel together, when uh, Roxbury International Film Festival came to me to put this panel together, I was kind of looking around at different things about animation and stuff. And I came across this quote um, from Norm Mac Norman McLaren, who's a, kind of a legend in the animation game. Um, animation is not the art of drawings that move, the art of movements that are drawn. 
so and that's how we came up with the drawing movements for this panel but so one of i mean one of the things i love about animation and is that's what bo most of you mentioned is that you are you build these worlds you, you know it's it, whatever is in your mind you can create given the time and the, the budget or the uh, you know talent um you know you can have space be in space you can be at the center of the earth you can have aliens you can have animals talking and but one of the challenging things and i i studied animation a bit in college i'm nowhere near to the level of you guys but uh, one of the things i always found was difficult was making animations look natural because even if you're having an alien that's got tentacles that go all around the place or, uh, you know, flying in the air, or doing completely unnatural things, the movement has to look natural or you've lost kind of the flow of what you're doing and that, the, you know, the audience will pick up on it. So I just wonder like, what, what are your favorite things to use for references as far as the movements um, that you do? And, um, you know, cause even like taking, you know, a character, taking a sip of tea, for instance, if it doesn't look right, then it, it's, it takes you out of the story. So um, what references do you, do you like to go to? Uh, what are your go-to references for movements? And I'll, uh, I'll let Uzo start on this one as well. Yeah, so for me, I use myself as a reference a lot. I'll record myself doing certain actions that I want to animate. I also find it really valuable to just like go out and explore what's around you because using like life and just like recording. Sometimes I just record like someone if they have like a really prominent walk and I want to try to replicate that. Or if I want to try to animate like something smaller, like yesterday I was at the park and I saw a turtle swimming in the water and I thought that would be cute to try to you know, animate. And so personally, I either work from reference like myself, I'll record myself doing things, or I'll just kind of find inspiration from the different movements of people just out and about in the world. Do you um, like find yourself taking a lot of videos or is it just kind of all replayed in your mind? Yeah, I take a lot of videos, also a lot of pictures, um, but that's less about animation and more about just like, you know, colors and such. But yeah, I take a lot of videos, a lot of videos. Great. And what about you, uh, Zero Snake? I see a lot of action going on in your uh, animations you have behind you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was an excellent quote you brought up. Uh, I kind of, I got another one that I kind of uh, let live rent, rent free in my head. It's uh, from Ty Hooks. It says that uh, that art is a reflection of life, and I learned that when I was in college. So, animation is an art form just like you know traditional illustration pencil whatever so learning from real life is one of the greatest greatest things that an artist could actually do like you said you want it to be believable and right? you just don't want it to seem wonky so i know one of the, some of the first animation practice that uh young animators get into is like a walk cycle you know so just learning how to how to make somebody walk right how to have their, their head bob and you know, their heel touch first instead of their, like, you know, their, their tippy toes. So just basically learning um, for more specific and like uh, advanced stuff, like you see like action scenes or whatever um, for my manga and my animation. A lot of reference come from myself because I'm saying I'm a big martial arts buff. You know what I'm saying I got, if you look around right now, I got like bow staffs and swords all over my room. So <laughs> I, I get my, I get hands on when I got to. And uh, if it comes to like anything else, you know, I love, uh, mixed martial arts, UFC, boxing, uh, you know, grappling. So uh, I'm watching that stuff constantly. You know what I'm saying? I'm constantly just bringing it back. Like, yo, 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 how did he, how did he get him in this submission? You know what I mean? Yeah. Just breaking it down constantly. So you, you take the, the bow staffs and the swords off the wall and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do a little something sometimes. They within arms reach of the bed, man. <laughs> they chose the wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> dope dope and what about you mark um yeah the same thing same thing that the, the rest of the, the panel is saying um it's, it's just really observing like like life um yeah tons of videos tons of videos like um of yourself acting out the performance that you want to capture um and just being observant outside and and just um just really studying you know, taking mental notes of, because of, people walk a million different ways, right? A walk cycle can look a, a million different ways. So just just observing like your, your surroundings and really taking mental notes 
of you know, unique things that you see and then trying to incorporate that into the um, the animation. Um, it's funny though, like like subtle animation is is you would think that action animation is 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 harder to it's harder to do, but the the subtle stuff is is really hard to convince because the move, movements are so like limited, like they're so like like small that you have to really study like really like like hard to really convince um, the audience of those like those subtle movements, you know. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's all complicated. Like like if you're gonna do like a bold staff scene, like that's so much physics goes into that and you have to like understand like the physics and making sure that's convincing as well so it's all uh, it's all really studying and, and breaking it down like 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 snake saying uh, just breaking it like down to like the the minute the minutia of it um and the more you know the more the more weight and the more physics you add to it the more real and more believable it looks so yeah all that stuff you, you just have to take account for and just study and just break it down and then and practice it what do you find like when you talk about like subtle movements can you give me like an example of what's like the one that you find the most challenging when you're like in a project and you're like oh this dude is like scratching his head or something and that's one that you're always yeah like, it's oh. it's the little things like that it's like okay like like action is, action is dope because you can choreograph really like, like pretty, at least for me personally, like you can choreograph that. Like if I hit this guy, I know for a fact that he's gonna fall back into space. But if you're just having a conversation and you wanna capture like real life, like there's so many things that a person could be doing. Like the person, like if you have somebody talking to another person, the person who's talking is gonna, you know, be expressing himself like, the way I'm using my hands. But then the person who is listening is not just gonna stand there stiff, you know? So he's gonna have these subtle movements if you want him to be annoyed, like you have a like, you have limited, uh, you can't make it a big scene. Like if he's annoyed, you have to really capture that in the minute expressions, you know? Mm -hmm. And just understanding like, like human performance, you know, is a little bit more challenging to, to to, to make that come across um at least for me maybe it's maybe it's just me <laughs> but that's that's it's it's not as easy as it as it sounds you know to make it feel really convincing mm -hmm. what about you mike what do you yeah, like to use for references that's true i mean it's i'm gonna echo everybody here it's pretty spot on um but i would add that i also like to um to use people that I um, admire as far as their animation. So an example I was thinking of was, um, um, what's his name from from uh, Spirited Away? I'm drawing the blank. Hayao Miyazaki. I'm Miyazaki, yeah. So Miyazaki has this like wonderful, he captures wonderful movements, right? So um, like a child walking, you know, there's, there's the weight of it, there's the unbalanced of it, right? Like, babies being unsturdy um, underfoot mm. but to capture that and to capture the the, the the baby spirit at the same time right so it, it's for me outside of capturing video and 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 everything else of of real life it sometimes it, it helps to fast forward if you're able to see someone who's done it before or who's mastered it before and you could study that as well like another example is um and Samurai Champ Lou, we, Mark and I, we were trying to uh, animate a, a graffiti, I mean, not graffiti, um, break dancing, a, a, a ninja b-boy, basically. And we wanted to get the windmill right. And so, you can we yeah, we studied Mugen in, in, in his fight scene with Jin in what, episode one or two. So things like that uh, help us get, you know, to the point where video might not be enough. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's a, such a great example. I mean, Miyazaki's work is breathtaking often, like, in just the way he captures movements and stuff. And I imagine that, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, like, a baby, like an off-balance baby walking has got to be really, really difficult because it's so, like, there's no pattern to it, particularly. Like, patterns you can, like, yeah. kind of 
drop into, but with a, something like that, I can imagine it would be really, really difficult. So my hat's off to y'all. But um, so technology has been changing, you know, it, it moves forward very, very quickly. And animation technology has changed a lot. I mean, animation has been around for 100 years or more. I mean, film animation, uh, of course, animation flip books and the rotoscopes or whatever um, existed for a long time before that. But with the introduction of like software and consumer grade software and apps and a access to animation has become much wider and um, bringing some new talent and energy into the animation field. And I just wonder like from when you started and I know Uzo, you're kind of new in the, um, the industry, but even like and as an observer, you know, since you started observing or doing animation, how has it changed? Like what's the techniques that people are using and the, you know, you know, the styles people are using, the technology people are using, what, what do you, you find has changed and what's the, the, you know, the new greatest thing that uh, has come out for animators at this point? And I will start with Mike for that one. Oh, as far as how, how I've seen it change and, and well, I, I just remember having a huge stack of paper all the time, right? All the time. And then you get done with the production, you put that in the box, save it for later. You got another stack of animation paper and using a light box and, you know, flipping through the pages manually. Um, so that's that's where I started. And so I was I was able to, watch the evolution of animation go from um, from from that traditional animating to, to digital, right? So now when I draw, I've been drawing on a Cintiq, uh, a screen for so long that when I draw, there's no friction on the screen. And so when I draw on paper, I can feel the friction a lot more. And it almost feels like nails on the chalkboard. That's not that bad, right? But you can feel the friction between the paper and the pencil. So, I mean, th there's there's benefits and there's also, you know, there's some there's some loss just like everything else. Um, I, I think some of the benefits is you can you can store a lot of, of art, um, although it's digital, um, but you can store massive amounts of art and you don't have to worry about the physical space of, you know, trying to um, keep these pristine uh, frames that you've hand drawn. Now you can have them, you know, on a hard drive, and, and you can pack them with, with thousands, hundreds of thousands of images. Um, we've had we've had um, storage facilities filled with with drawings. You know what I mean? So, but you also lose that. That I feel like when when you, and not to get too esoteric, but when you you go through the digital uh, device, right? I think there is a a slight, uh, I wouldn't call it um, disruption, but it, it's not the same as your hand going through paper, right? So this, the spirit aspect of it, uh, I feel like you lose a little bit, but you're still, it's still another medium, but I think the electric part of it um, interferes slightly. This, this, the craftsmanship gets a little, uh, it's, a, it's a little easier to, to erase and and make mistakes and you so that's the freedom there you know and you don't have to be tense i remember when inking um you know final production uh, frames i'd get tense because if i make a mistake and i'm like 90 percent through the piece i'd have to you know white it out and try to make it look cool but you know that that tension it is not the same anymore because of the the easiness of making mistakes Gotcha. Yeah, it's, um, I always think about, there's this quote I heard about like Japanese water painters, right? Where they, they had to paint these things in one stroke. And if they made a mistake, the whole thing was ruined. And that's kind of like what inking was uh, back when you had to ink on paper. And uh, I mean, I do, I do love digital because of that, because I can make mistakes and just go back and yeah. fix it, which is really, really nice. Really convenient. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, but it also, it does, you're right, it loses some of the, the tactile feel of, you know, graphite to paper, ink to paper. So what about you, Zero Snake? What's, what's changed in the 10 years that you've been animating? 
as far as like what you use. Right. Right. So uh, first off, kudos to the Davis brothers, because, um, you know, I know about the light box. I know about like, you know, drawing paper. And, you know, I, I did a couple of like, you know, animation that way. And boy, it's like pulling teeth. But, you know, it, it really is. Animation is already like pulling teeth. That is. But, you know, um, there's a charm. There's a charm to the older animation. Like even now, like I don't I don't usually watch most modern anime. I usually I go back to like the eighties, nineties stuff that no one ever even knows about or talk about. And like, you know, I, I get inspired by the way that like, you know, the backgrounds are like hand painted, a lot of them. Like uh so you you could you could generally tell um where the background where the background is and where the, the characters that can move are, similar to a, like Tom and Jerry almost similar technique. But um, uh, going for it, I'm saying moving for it past that, that's kind of like that's kind of like my era, like you know, uh, where digital animation kind of started. You started seeing more indie people, and websites like Newgrounds, and you know, um, just a couple couple more like that, you know. But uh, Flash was Flash was new. People were just making um, you know, parodies of video games, whatever the case. But um, that was pretty much what what I seen. And I was like, okay, now I have a community. Where I could like try to hone my craft and become one of the best in it. You know I mean, um, and uh, how has it changed since then? Well, we see Flash is dead, Coco dead now. Uh, <laughs> it's like a tons of new animation uh, programs coming out each and every year. A lot of them free on uh, people's tablets and uh, you know various devices. People could, people could draw little flip books on phones now. So making animation has become a lot more accessible. So even the fact, even the point where like me as like, uh, I'm, I'm still kind of indie, though I got like, you know, a, a couple of strings I could pull here and there, like other artists or whatever, but for the most part indie, I'm now able to, you know, reach out to, you know, animator out there, some XYZ land, you know what I'm saying? And he might not have a light box. He might not have the same camera. I'm saying that I got set up and, you know, but he could still work at the same resolution as me sending over. Uh, I'm saying, you know, I look over it, make sure it all looks coherent like you wouldn't see like this is animation a it's animation b to me so um the the playing field has expanded you know yeah yes yes so um i'm gonna move to mark next but uh, so i know that like back in the day right and and you brought up an interesting point zero snake that like you know with the internet you can work with people who are not next to you, right? Because back in the day, it used to be, there would be bullpens or something, you know, a, a bunch of animators would be in the room together, working together. So now that, you know, that technology is that you don't have to be in a room, is that is that how it's working now? And I ask you, Mark, because I know you're out there in LA in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. What's that like? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a few things that that's changed like significantly um because like mike's saying we 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 came in right before digital was like the the, the industry standard so we was we was there when a lot of people were trans transitioning including us we were still on paper um and then like our first like our first gig was like transitioning into like you had to learn digital so we was just forced to get, get on the cintiq and just like do everything there but we would first draw it on paper then scan it and then trace over our drawings that's how mm. we got that's how we learned digital um and this was years ago this was like 2007 ish or something like that um but yeah i mean so we would we would when we we went to korea um visit an animation studio and it was all like a huge bullpen of animators they were still on paper at the time um and everything was done traditionally. Everybody had to be in the same room. Everybody had to be in the same studio. Um, and for the most part, it was like it was it was like that in LA. Um, but as of like, and people were still like working remotely. Like you could still like hire a guy from like Detroit or or um, even like overseas and stuff. Um, but it wasn't like commonplace. Um, we for the most part, you still had to be in the studio. But now since the whole COVID era just completely changed the game. And now we have, even though we're starting to go back into like the studios, a lot of people are like, I'm not going back because they they see that 
we're able to like, like we have a lot of guys who are just not in, even in this country working for us, you know? And like, it's it works fine, it works well. So a lot of people who initially, like before the whole COVID era, like we're working in studios, now a lot of people are saying they, they would rather work from home because it does create that that work, um, you know, that, that home and, and work-life balance. Um, but so so that's one part. So so it's still kind of like I don't know what's going to happen, but it is very possible for, for everything to be remote and people just to continue to work how it is now to to like to do these like productions. But um, so the verdict is still out on that. But I, I think it will come back to people working in the studio, because even though it is great to have like to, to work remotely, there's still a lot of challenges in just getting answers without having to get an email, you know, like right. just small logistical things like that, like it really cuts into production time. So um, it's still in flux right now. But um, as far as how technology has changed, um, we're kind of seeing like, like, like a little bit of a revol revolution in animation because there's so many programs now that is really like, like Adobe Animate is one that comes to mind and that program you could it's really user friendly um and it it breaks down like it breaks down movement and animation but a lot of the stuff is like built in you know and it is all really computer mostly computer generated but i can imagine people getting that program and just really just like pushing it to its limits and just freaking the, the type of animation that will come out of it like there's like pre-built everything like even cg animation everything's pre-built like you can really just pull from libraries and just make it your own so it's super accessible now as opposed to back when when we were coming it's just a few years ago like we had to create everything like maybe even five years ago five ten years ago we had to create everything now it's just like i mean if you're just starting now there's so many resources that you can um even just social networking, reaching out to people too, as you don't have to create everything. You can collab with people and stuff. Like it's just, it's really accessible now. If you got your hustle right, you can really, you know, make things happen. That's dope. And I, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Animate because uh, my son, who also had a film in the Roxbury Film Festival, we did a little stop motion dope. thing, but he's been getting into Animate and I hadn't looked at it since it was Flash. And they had so many things that you could add into it and we played around a little bit and then he's watching this tv show and he's like they made that in animate they made that in animate like all of like the pbs kids yeah. stuff is definitely mm -hmm. done in animate so it's really interesting to see how they're using it professionally but it's also very accessible to you know even like a seven-year-old can get a little something done in there with some, some training but Uzo, I wanted to ask you, I know that you you haven't been in the industry for a super long time but I also I would wonder a little different question is like, what did you learn on, you know, this project creating this film for the film festival? Yeah, so I, because I started so recently, I actually never experienced animating with like a light box and, you know, with actual paper. Though I think it would be cool to eventually just like try it out sometime just to, you know, see what it was like. But I started digitally. Um, my film was made entirely on, um, a program, I use a program Krita to animate it. I use Procreate to create the backgrounds. I use Final Cut Pro X to make like the final like camera panning movements. But honestly, creating this animation taught me a lot about, you know, creating an animation because typically I had been making like a lot of really small and short like loops. And so this was actually like my first attempt at like a narrative sequence. And so I learned a lot about, you know, how to use color, how to use camera movements to tell a story, um, how to use, you know, audio to enhance a story, how to use, you know, different um, animating animation programs. Um, I hope to, you know, utilize more animation programs in the future. Krita is a free program for anyone interested that you can definitely check out. Um, but I also know there's Adobe Animate, there's also TV Paint. Um, but yeah, I think this first short animation taught me a lot about, you know, how to piece together an animation and how to, you know, execute it. Um, so I honestly am really grateful and value that experience. And also like one thing I can actually pitch in 
to your initial question about like what I've observed has changed is I have noticed in a lot of um, like bigger studios when it comes to animation, at least like the feature film, there's a lot, there's been a shift towards like 3D animation versus 2D animation. And if you, for those on the um, attendees who don't know the difference, essentially 3D is like movies like Tangled and The Incredibles and 2D is like Princess and the Frog or Mulan. And um, I think that shift is a rather interesting one. Personally, I'm a huge fan of 2D animation and I really hope, you know, it doesn't ever go extinct. I love that form of animating. Um, but yeah, that's just like one um, thing I've noticed as an observer watching, you know, the industry and watching what has been made. But um, yeah, that is my answer. That's a good point. That's a good point that the, the shift towards 3D animation. And I think that, I, you know, it's, it's new and shiny and glossy. And so everybody's kind of like moving towards it now. But I think that, you know, 2D animation still definitely has a place um, in the, you know, filmmaking and uh, animation spectrum. So I, I do, I too hope that it continues because I think it has a lot to add to it. But I want to uh, get into just um, some influences. I know we've, we've mentioned a couple names along the uh, our conversation here, but I just want to get into some like, who are some in influences, who are some people that folks should check out um, their work um, and that influenced your work? And I will start with Mark. Yes. Thank you for starting with me because I know <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to take right, You get mics. the good ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so Otomo, uh, Katsuhiro Otomo, who, who did Akira, is is like me and Mike's like, like that's the guy that really like captivated a lot of um, like what you can do as far as just the technical side of the drawing, but also just like the grit you know, telling the story the way you want to tell it. So um, definitely Otomo. Um, and then I would even say like um, Miyazaki, like we said before, is a, is a really good influence. Um, and then even some of the, the um, you know, the stuff that's done here, the um, like the, the G.I. Joes and the, um, just, I don't know the artists behind them, but like, um, like the G.I. Joes and, and you know, Justice League type of stuff, um, you know, really played a, a good part of it too. Like Bruce Timm's probably a huge influence. Um, it was just those, those, those guys right there. Um, I'm leaving some for my brother because I don't want to take all of them so he can have an answer. But yeah, those play a big part. Cool. How about you, Zero Snake? Who's your influences? So, um, Starting off, like I said, uh, I was I was influenced by a lot of like fellow flash animators, so I give kudos to Eagle Raptor and um, Vinny Vertes. Uh, those those two like uh, just they had like a raw and organic kind of like art style. It wasn't you know the most polished, not the most detailed, but um, you know uh, I did I did learn certain things from them, like you know how to not be afraid with character design when I'm looking at Vinny Vertes and like, uh, you know, how to make things be bubbly and cartoony, but still funny uh, with Eagle Raptor. So, you know, um, even when I'm working on like a serious animation, there's, there's like little bursts of humor and stuff. And like, you know, a lot of that comes from that. Um, other inspirations, like I said, is uh, Kung Fu movies or whatever, like the, the Run Run Shaws or whatever, like, you know, and anything past that would be like studying from the greats like Kentaro Mura from Berserk, you know, uh, Takeshi, uh, I mean, uh, Takeshi Inoue from um, Vagabond, okay? Takeshi Koike, if you looking at animators and, you know, just how to set up different shots and angles. So, you know, salute to the greats, man, honestly. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing, uh, traditional art, because, uh, you know, we don't, that doesn't get enough credit. You know, like traditional, uh, you would say Western art or you know, classical art. I learned a lot from that, like, you know, uh, contrast and values and you know, perception and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely something to be said for that art as well. Um, what about you, Uzo? Yeah, so starting out, I 
There's so many, so many people. But one person who's already been mentioned, Hayao Miyazaki, I think is an, inc an incredible visionary when it comes to animation. And it's funny because when I shared my first short on social media, a lot of people were like, you know, this gives me like those type of vibes just because my animation, there was a lot of emphasis on like the natural environment and just, I really like making things pretty and I really like having like an illustrative quality to my work. And so a lot of people commented on that and it was like, you know, this kind of reminds me of his films just because of, you know, your emphasis on like nature, which is a big thing that he would talk about in his films, this idea of finding beauty in the mundane, which I think is incredible. And I would love to like hold on to that in my work as well. Um, I also find inspiration in a lot of like indie studios, like the line animation is a, is a London based animation studio who ha makes incredible work. Um, Cartoon Saloon is an Irish based studio who also makes like incredible like feature films, 2D animated feature films. Um, there are animators on YouTube, like one example is I think it's pronounced Voon. Voon, she's a YouTube animator who makes these like short form stories utilizing a 2D animation style, which I think is really fun and something I would love to try um, someday. But I also think the internet can be a really great place for discovering new people, Twitter especially. There are so many incredible animators whom I don't, I can't recall by name, but there's so much talent that just on Twitter, people sharing like their reels or sharing like short form animations that they created just for fun or as a study. So I think being in those like artist spaces online has also been super beneficial for my growth as an animator because I am constantly exposed to like incredible work and incredible art by all types of people. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, Twitter does, it has a ton of, animation comes across my feed, which I, there's those short ones that I really enjoy, but it's also, you were mentioned that like across the world, animation gets a lot more respect than a lot of other countries. You know, like a lot of people are mentioning Japan, but like Canada, uh, France, they all like fund and support animation as an art form. And uh, I think a lot of great stuff comes out from there as well. And, uh, but I'll kick it to you, Mike, what's a, uh, What's a uh, did your brother forget to mention? They've all been taken. If <laughs> if my brother didn't make it, um, say it, then Zero Snake or, or Uzo took it. So, and I can't believe I I brain froze on um, Miyazaki earlier, but Miyazaki definitely is um, a big inspiration, and and I have to echo Mark when we talk about um, Katsuhiro Otomo from from Akira. If if those who, who don't know um, who he is. I just love the, the the scale of of his work. You know, he he makes everything feel bigger than life, and he does. He, he did some really interesting and and you know groundbreaking things in in the eighties. Um, uh, Sunichiro uh, Watanabe, um, always mess up his name, but um, yeah. But you know, uh, I want to. I just I want to mention a couple of of artists that inspired me right before um, animation, right? So so some of the people like um, uh, Dawood Anyabwile who, who did Brother Man, he, I, I like to mention him because he was the one that um, Zero Snake mentioned earlier that, that you know, you, you usually like, you know, you're doing fan work and then some clicks, and then you're like, oh, I have some characters that I want to bring to life. He's, uh, Dawood is the one who, who did it for us because we would draw a lot of uh, a lot of characters and, and a lot of fan art, but then we saw his work and realized, wow, like this is a, a direct reflection of our culture and it speaks directly to us with a voice that we understand. And I think that was a catapult for us to, to get us from that illustration phase and then into, into animation. So I just want to add that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Dawood because his, I mean, Brother Man Comics is amazing, but also he is, his images are very, they have a lot of motion. Like, I mean, he doesn't, as far as I know, do animation, but you know, the movement of his characters is just so fluid. And I could see how that would inspire, you know, uh, moving into animation and stuff. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned him. But uh, I want to give some time to, I have some audience questions here that I'm gonna throw out and um, any of you can just answer it. We'll do it popcorn style with this one. So here's a question from the audience. Can you describe instances where the art movement aligned with other movements? More specifically, I'd like to learn more about how we can use art to push for environmental justice and the climate movement. Okay. 
how does how does art and you know um, movements come together? Which is can, really can I deep. jump in on this one? Absolutely, quick? go for it. I, I think, um, and I, and I hope I'm um, on the right track with this. But animation, as we were saying, has the capacity to um, it's boundless, right? So you you can capture the effects, let's say for global warming, for example, right? You can capture the actual effects of what's happening in an animation and you can relate the information in a way that's a lot more digestible than trying to showcase it in, in a live action, right? Um, unless you do like 3D stuff, which is still animation, but it ha it's a great vehicle to get the point across really quickly, right? So a lot of, a lot of people, do like almost um, infographic type explainer videos, you know? Um, so I, I think there's an animation out there that talks about um, the race of discrimination or something like this, where it talks about how, um, you know, black people were, were, didn't get a head start, right? We were 400 years behind the, the economic um, social mobility living in the United States due to, to slavery, right? And, and this animation showcases a race where um, people who own slaves had this 400 years to build wealth. And then once the 400 years uh, was up, then black people start to run the race and try to catch up. But then it has to hurdles like poverty. And I don't know if y'all have seen this one, but it, it's something that I think is, it's an animation that aligns perfectly with, with the historic um, importance of, of why Black people are in the socioeconomic condition that we are in today, because there's a big um, misconception that Black people put themselves in this situation where people who don't really re read history or read between the lines understand that this is not a choice. This is a situation that was engineered. So animation can speak to things like that directly. It can speak to things like the Black Lives Movement. It can do all these things where it can capture the essence of a movement and have it um, be disseminated in, in an explainer video or a quick soundbite. Right, uh, and I, I agree with that, man. Um, just real quick, so like, uh, this isn't an animation, but it's a webcomic. There's a webcomic out there called like Trash Mermaid. And uh, it's, it's basically like, if you could imagine the Little Mermaid from, from Disney and uh, like, you know, they make it, they have like cute and kind of funny ways of like showing like the pollution. So uh, for example, like she might be swimming and she sees a plastic bag in the ocean and she she looks at it she, and uh, like next pen it over, you see her wearing like as a shirt, you know? So there, there are ways to like make uh, harsh, our subjects more tolerable, you know, while while not losing the message, you know, yeah. yeah. I also wanted to add to that as well. I think one of, another really powerful thing about art and animation is that I think in order to, you know, kind of envision the future you want to see when we think about political and social movements, sometimes that requires like radical imagination. And I think art and animation allow us to visualize the futures that we want to see. One thing I really like to say in my work is that I like to, I use art as a medium of illustrating a better world. And I think that can be more broadly seen in animation as well. It allows us to imagine, you know, a world that we want to see, a country that we want to see and use our, our tools of art, use the tools of our imagination and the collective imagination of those around us to kind of visualize, okay, I want to see this change, what would that look like? And then you can create that in the form of art, or you can create that in the form of animation. Beautiful. Anyone else want to, uh, Mark, do you want to hear the only one left? Do you want to chime in on that? Sure. I mean, this is, it's kind of, it's kind of campy, but it, but it, the intent behind it was, um, it was really dope. And it was back in the eighties, Captain Planet, right? So, um, you, you have a, 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 you have a clear message and it's, it's geared towards kids, right? Because kids, um, for the most part, um, you know, consume a lot of animation. And so, 
and this is one of the things that 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 I um I always think about um animation being a tool um to educate as well, you know. So if you have a captive audience, you have kids who sit in there watching watching Captain Planet. As silly as the cartoon is, the message is is endearing, and it gets kids to start thinking about the environment in certain ways, you know. Um, and you can use that for for like, like I mean, for any platform, you know, or, or any movement. Um, it's just a powerful tool altogether. So, um, yeah, you can you can and you can use that tool and you know promote whatever you need to promote, you know. Yeah. I think that's a good point that it's, you know, comics and animation both, I think are really good ways of getting across a message in a kind of e easily digestible way. Instead of just like talking at someone, you're giving them, you know, they're putting them in the story and giving them something to look at while they're learning, which I think is super dope. Uh, we got one more question from the audience and as we're running pretty low on time, but uh, this one's a pretty good one. Um, just asking about apps and software that you like to use for animation. And I, we, we, we got into it a little bit, Animate, um, and you know, the one that you mentioned, Zoe, which I can't remember the name of, but are there any others that you would recommend? Yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend, um, uh, so for, I would recommend Harmony and Storyboard Pro for um, you know those two. If you, like from Storyboard Pro, you can go directly into Harmony and animate that way. And then just drawing tools. And I haven't animated in this program, but Clip Studio Paint is a really dope program. I really like that program for illustration. Um, and then Procreate is great for illustrations as well. But Harmony to Toon Boom to Storyboard Pro to, to Harmony is is what I uh, is what I like. Great. Anybody else? So, um, you know, as everyone was saying, there's so many programs out here. The If I had just like boil it down, if you're focusing on frame by frames and stuff, you probably want to probably want to go like a vector based program. You know, a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? Like for example, uh, Flash, like Animate, that's a vector based program. Um, if you want to do things like, like, you know, I still use Photoshop for backgrounds and you can do an animation to a degree uh, in Photoshop. It just really depends on what you're going for at that time, you know, um, is wise to try to double up on programs where one thing, where one can't do something, uh, another can. Um, so yeah, j just find the combination that works best for you. But when, you, when you're done with the animation, you probably want to uh, throw it into a video editing program specifically like uh like premiere was was mentioned and like uh like final cut pro anything like that to make it look official you know and then you want to it's so much stuff like you know color correction um you know make sure the lip flaps is on there just make sure you got a you got you got some reliable uh I don't know, editing stuff to make it look right mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. So as we're getting back in, into our like last couple of minutes here, I just wanted to ask you all like for people trying to get into animation, young folks or just people who just want to try their hand at animation, what advice would you give to them um, just starting out? And anybody can just jump in on that one. I'll jump in. Um, I, I would just say try to create a um, a social media presence, um, scour all the studios, um, look look who's hiring for what, and um, apply and start getting to know the recruiters. And um, yeah, because because they do they do scour the the, the internet for for talent. So um, put your material up online, and then um, you know join organizations that um, you know. There, there's a lot of organizations that that are trying to get people people to break into the industry. Um, Rise Up Animation is one that focuses on people of color. Um, women of women in animation focus on women, um, and so those are really two organizations that has ties to to the studios directly. Um, so that that's that's how I would start, and then just 
even the creators, even the people who are who are working in the industry, you know, befriend them online and you know follow them and try to create some type of um, rapport and um, you know any way you can to get noticed and, and and get your work in front of the people who's hiring. Right. I would just I would just say um, to start start getting something done, even if it's just uh, experimental animations, animatics, uh, you know, roughs, anything, you know, just starting to get a, to get a grasp on on the fundamentals. You know, you understand frames, you understand tweens, uh, and stuff of that nature. And then from there, you know, if there are things where you're still lacking with, like uh, say backgrounds, a lot of people. Um, don't study backgrounds until later, which is understandable. You know, you can always try to find someone else trying to do what you're doing and, um, you know, just kind of collab on, on something, you know, it, a lot of people just want to be a part of a project that looks nice or got something going on. So just find, find out people that's like-minded and, uh, you know, just, just, just work on something, something that is better than nothing really. That's true. He, he... So at some point you just got to take the plunge, you know, um, if it's a dip in your toe, you can watch this tons of tutorials on, on, uh, on YouTube. And, you know, the, the, the newest program that I learned was um, After Effects, which is, you know, good for when I want to animate text and stuff like that. And I didn't know it at all. I mean, I taught myself, well, I had a couple workshops, but whenever I need to, to figure out a new movement i could just go to youtube and and there's usually something there that will help me get through that specific action that i need you know so i would say take advantage of all the resources that are out there because uh, they're there for you to take advantage of you know Uzo, any advice yeah i would agree with so much of what we've already said i think for me, I, I think echoing, um, echoing, oh, I actually don't remember who said this, I'm sorry, but whoever mentioned the importance of a social media presence, I think that alone has helped me a lot when it comes to finding work and connecting with people and, you know, just getting my work out there. And I think building a community or finding a community of other artists is also so important because it allows you to work with one another. It allows you to create with one another without, you know, um, worrying too much about, about, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to articulate this idea of networking across, essentially. When you find a community of people, there's no power imbalances. You're all in the same equal playing field. You're all trying to learn. So you can all learn and grow from one another. You can all rise together. And so I think, you know, putting yourself out there, though it can be scary, is probably one of the most important things. And finding a creative community of people who are doing what you're doing, I think, is so incredibly important. And both of those things have helped me so much so far in my animation career already. Awesome. So true. And that's, you know, comics and color. That's what we're all about, just connecting people together, um, artists. So um, I think we are out of time, but I wanted to let each of you just... Uh, say where people can find you, your website, or your social media, uh, so people can check out more of your work. Oh, uh, why don't you start, Zero Snake? All right. So thanks, guys, for joining. You can find my, my, my work at zerosnake.com. Um, my, my book is also on the new Black Sands uh, publishing mobile app. So you can check it out there. And uh, you can check me out on Instagram at zerosnake.media. I can't wait to see you out there, man. Go. I see my uh, Mike. You put it up there, uh, but tell yeah, me where I, to find you. I, um, so you can you can see our follow us on Instagram at, at Mad Twins. There's two eyes and a Z, and you could also um, see our work on our website, which is Mad Twins, the same spelling dot com. Awesome. Those are the and that's for both of you, right? Yeah. Okay, dope. And Uzo? Yeah, my website is my first and last name, uzoonglu.com, and you can find me on Instagram at Uzo the Artist. Awesome. I'll definitely follow that. Well, thank you all so much. This was an amazing panel, a great conversation. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you from Roxbury Film Festival. Thank you from Comics and Color. 
Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the audience members who came and uh, joined this conversation. And uh, everybody have a great day.